All right, hello everyone. This is Professor Bowles, AKA Ian. How's everybody doing in the COVID-19 era? Hopefully you're all doing well. Um, so tonight's our first online class. Hopefully everything goes as well as it possibly can. Um, I'm going to basically walk you through tonight's lab the way I would typically do it in class. Um, obviously the issue here is that we can't do Q&A in real time, but I'm going to record my screen. Um, I'll apologize in advance. I have two wonderful children and a dog and a gardener outside who's also mowing the lawn all at the same time. So maybe some background noise, maybe a kid banging on the door, maybe a dog barking, maybe everything at the same time. You never know. You might get lucky. At any rate, um, we're going to get going and I'm going to shoot to have this at one hour uh, and no more. All right. So tonight we are doing module nine, project one. So the first thing you'll need to do is find the data. Okay, so just like we've been doing uh, over the course of the semester, you're going to want to go to arcgis.com, do a quick search for Karen and Colvord, K E R A N E N K O L E O O R D, enter. Make sure that you choose groups. And there's Karen and Colvord, two last names. And then tonight's, or today's, whenever you end up doing this, data will be the Virginia forest data. All right, so go ahead and click the three lines, the three dots there, download. You're going to download the data to your computer's hard drive. Now we don't have to worry about the USB drive situation, I guess. So I've already downloaded it, and I have already moved it into the appropriate folder. So you just need to download it and save it locally. Next thing we're going to do is open up ArcGIS Pro. Here's a little sneak peek what the end result will look like tonight. For now, we're going to actually save this old project. We're going to do a new one for tonight. New map. You will call it mod9 underscore proj1 underscore your last name. Save it to a project folder that is easy for you to identify. And of course, everything's looking strange here at C232 Labs. All right. Okay, so we've downloaded the data, you've saved it locally. So once you've got your new working ArcGIS Pro project, you are going to go to the Geoprocessing tab if you have it open. If you don't, you're going to go to Analysis, Tools, and then do a search. Do a search for Extract Package. There it is, Extract Package under Data Management Tools. Input package will be the Virginia data that you just downloaded, Virginia Forest. And so wherever you saved it, that's where you're going to want to navigate to find it. All right. And then for the output folder, just save it to the project folder that you are currently working in and give it a run. All right, once it's extracted, go back to the catalog pane, go to your folders, and then refresh the default folder for your project. And it will be in the P13 folder, the infamous P13 folder. In this case, Virginia Forest 1, we have two layers in the feature data set. We're going to drag and drop them onto the map. And then there they are. All right, so before we get going on any analysis, we'll do the obligatory uh, parameter environment settings. So go ahead and open up environments. And we will set the coordinate system and base it off of GWNF. Now, what is GWNF? This is George Washington National Forest. 
I advise everybody to actually read the little introductory scenario just so you have your bearings. But essentially what we're doing is we're working with data in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, George Washington National Forest there, and uh, obviously it's in the state of Virginia. Uh, so we will also change our processing extent to GWNF. Hit OK. All right, so we've got our environment set. And next thing we will do is quickly just adjust the uh, symbology for Virginia counties. We'll make that symbology hot black hollow, no fill. And for GWNF, we will make that mm, the color of a forest. How about that? So we'll make it like fur green, or leaf green rather, sorry. Uh, and then also, let's add a transparency. You probably hear my two-year-old in the background now. That's okay. He's a pretty cool guy, just a little bit loud. All right, so we add a little bit of transparency. My set mine to 27, but you can make it any transparency you want that's, I would say, below 30 or 35. All right, so we've added those to the map. We have done our environment settings. Next up, let's change the layer name. So from VA counties, let's change it to just counties because it's obviously only in Virginia, so we don't need that identifier. So let's make that counties. And then GWNF, let's change that to GWNF underscore park. And the reason why is because later on we're going to have an LAS file that's also called GWNF, and it's just easier for, uh, for reference sake to have them slightly differentiated. All right. So moving on, next thing we're going to do is uh, create an LAS data set. So let's go to the Geo Processing tab if you have it open. If not, just go to Analysis Tools and search for Create LAS Data Set. And there will be Create LAS Data Set under Data Management Tools. Input file will be located in your P actually right in the same folder where you had the P13 folder map package extracted. So in my case, it's in the home folder, common data, user data, then LAS, N16, 3803, 10. If at any point you need to obviously locate files or, you know, back up, take a break, you can always pause the recording and, you know, rewind as needed and pause as needed, okay? That's, the, I guess, the benefit of uh, having the class online with recordings is that if you have questions, you can uh, paste it at your own. All right. So, okay. So we've got our LAS data set selected. We will keep the default projection. We will keep everything default except we will check store relative paths. Once that is ready, we will go ahead and give it a... Oh. You know, I skipped something. I apologize. Let's actually change this from the default output name to, as I mentioned before, GWNF underscore LAS. So we've got GWNF Park and GWNF LAS. All right, then go ahead and give it a run. All right, so it's done, but it's a fairly small area relative to the size of the park, so you probably didn't see much happen. The way to locate it is to right-click on the new output LAS file and click Zoom to Layer, and you will probably see a red box. So first things first, let's get it above the other layers so it's not obscured by anything. That red, red box means there's your LAS data, but there are too many uh, points in the point cloud to show up. So if you zoom in a little bit more, there you go. You ought to get it to to show up okay so that's just because we're talking about millions and millions of points best way to deal with that is to zoom in a little bit closer all right so we've created our point cloud file fantastic let's do uh just a brief symbology change so go ahead and make sure that gwnf is selected click on appearance uh, make sure that the display limit is set to 800,000 right now we can leave that as is uh, we can leave density right about the middle. We're going to do symbology, elevation, and then let's move the symbol scale a little bit closer to minimum. All right, so maybe about a quarter or an eighth of the way towards minimum. Okay. All right. 
Okay, next thing we're gonna do is find out the spatial resolution of the point cloud. And we talked about this in class before. It's called point spacing. And what that refers to is the space, the average space or distance from one point to the next. Now, in a raster file, you can always just look at the properties to find out what the resolution is. With a point cloud, you have to go through a Python setting. Uh, basically, you run the Python script to find out what it is. So let's do that together. We will go to Analysis, click on Python. It'll open up the Python window at the bottom. And we are going to use an ArcPy language tool here. So type in Arc, and you should see ArcPy show up. So then within ArcPy, you're going to have a litany of commands. Now, obviously, you could sort through them all and choose the one you want, but that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. So if you just keep typing, we're now going to do describe. Choose describe there. All right, it's a function. And then it's going to ask, what would you like to describe? In our case here, we want to describe the GWNF LAS file. So go ahead and select that. Then at the end, we're going to enter point spacing, and that will tell us what the point spacing is. Go ahead and hit enter. The point spacing is 1.5334. Now, what is that point, that uh, 1.5334? What are those units? Those units are feet. How do we know that? Because our map projection is in US feet. The first layers that you add to any map are going to set the projection. And this one is a, uh, I believe it's a state plane. But you can tell if you look your, move your cursor right around there, you'll see the units, feet, US. So the space, the average space from one point in the point cloud to the next is about one and a half feet. OK. Next, we're going to move on to what's called deliverable two. So essentially, the next product you're going to be working on is an actual map. And to get to the final map product, we're going to calculate um, the height of the forest essentially in this area and we're going to do so by first creating a digital elevation model which is a bare earth representation of the surface of the earth or the, the forest in this area then we're going to create a dsm a digital surface model which is a digital representation of the visible surface or the first returns of the lidar laser and once we've created the surface model and the elevation model we're going to subtract the elevation from the surface to get the difference between the two, which would be the representation of the vegetation height. OK. All right. So um, I'm going to just read this from the text real quick. So remember that LiDAR is elevation data that you can classify into various surfaces by filtering the data. A DEM is a bare earth model with a ground classification that shows points that are classified as ground compared to a DSM that shows first return data from the classification codes. You can access this data on the Appearance tab by clicking the Filters arrow. We're going to come to that in a bit, but know that if you want to switch between the surface and the first returns, you do so in the Appearance Filters uh, menu. All right, so let's first create our Digital Elevation Model, or DEM. To do this, we're going to actually create a new map. To do a new map, you're going to click on the catalog pane first. There are actually a couple of ways to do this, but we're going to click on the catalog pane. We are going to open up the maps or maximize the maps folder. Right click on first, let's change the name of map before we right click. We're going to change it. So you just hover your cursor over it till it's editable. And we're going to call it GWNF, George Washington National Forest. All right, so we've changed the name of our original map. And now we're going to copy it and then paste it back in. And this next map that we've created, the copy, we are going to call DEM. And as you can probably guess, we are going to use this map to create our DEM. So double click DEM, and it will open up the new map. Notice how we now have two tabs, sort of like your browser, right? So let's take one of the tabs, drag it until you see this little option here, this little um, icon that shows up. Move your cursor over that icon, then let it let it go. And now we've got both maps side by side. So we've got George Washington National Forest on the left, and we've got the DEM on the right. Okay. So one great thing about Arc Pro is that you can have multiple map views open at a given time and link them together. So this is what we're going to do. Right now, as it stands, if you move the cursor around or move the, move the mouse um, the map around on one map frame, it does nothing to the other. They're independent of one another. So we're going to link them together. So click on the View tab, Link Views, then choose Center and Scale. 
So that means not only will the moving the cursor of the mouse in one, one map move the other, it will also scale them together. So if you zoom in and out, they have the same scale. If you pan them, they have the same extent. Okay. So first thing we'll do is right click GWNF, zoom to layer. And we'll have to zoom in just a bit for the point cloud to show up. Maybe a bit more. All right, it's going to be difficult for me. There we go. All right, so making sure that DEM, the DEM map frame is selected, we're going to click on appearance and set the display limit for the point cloud to 2,500, 2.5 million. That means that the maximum number of points that are visible at any time are 2.5 million. And if you noticed on the left map over here, my display limit was 800,000, meaning 800,000 points are, are visible at any point. And now that you've got two maps side by side, you might be able to notice there's a difference in density of points. It may be a little bit difficult to tell in the video, but I can definitely tell with my eyes here that the map on the right has a slightly higher density of points, uh, about three times the density. All right, now we are going to change the filter to ground, making sure the DEM is selected. Go to LAS points, change the filter to ground, and that's going to filter out all returns that are not from the ground. So that would be any that uh, essentially are first returns if there is then a consequent uh, second, third, or fourth return. All right, so we've got our filter set. Next thing we're going to do is create a raster from the LAS file. So we're going to go back to geoprocessing. Cl go, click the little back arrow if you need to so you're at the geoprocessing search bar. And in there, you're going to type in LAS dataset to raster. And that will be under conversion tools. Let's go ahead and click that. For our input LAS dataset, it will be obviously the only point cloud we have. For the output, let's call it, guess what, DEM, what a surprise. All right, we'll leave elevation and binning as default, but for cell assignment, we'll change that to maximum, all right, because we want the maximum height. And then for a void fill method, we will change that to natural neighbor. Leave floating point, cell size, sampling value, and Z factor as the defaults, and then go ahead and run it. And the output is a DEM. You can zoom out a little bit to see it better. So there's our digital elevation model. Obviously, it just uses the default symbology, white being a higher number, higher value, black being a lower value. But you can sort of intuit that the higher elevations are there in the west, lower elevations are there in the east. Um, but we're not going to leave it as a black and white default symbology. We are going to change the symbology to what's called elevation one symbology scheme. So you can either just click on the symbology um, in the in the contents pane or you can right click on DEM and click on symbology that way. It brings up the same thing either way. But what we want to do is change the color scheme to what's called elevation one. So hit the drop down and then by default show names is not checked. So go ahead and check it then that will give a name to every one of the different symbology schemes. The one we're looking for, elevation one, is in alphabetical order. So scroll down until you find it. Go ahead and select that. And that would be good for now. So you can go ahead and close the symbology pane if you'd like to. All right, so we have our DEM selected. And in your textbook, it has a question here. So I'll just throw this out to you. Uh, what are the lowest and highest elevations represented in the DEM? How might we answer that question? If we look on our contents pane, you look for the highest and lowest value there in the symbology uh, legend. So uh, 2,451 feet. We know that's feet because we know what the units are for this map already. All right, it says right down there, feet. And lowest value is 1,571 feet. So difference of about 900 feet from the bottom of that valley, if you will, to the top of those mountains or hills, if you will. All right. Moving on, we're now going to create our digital surface model, the DSM. 
So uh, to, to do that, we're going to actually create another map. And just so you know, the reason we're creating these different maps, we obviously could do them all on the same map, but the reason we're going to do different maps is that ultimately when we do our final layout, it's going to have four different map inserts. It's going to have a digital elevation model, a digital surface model, uh, the general park boundaries, and then also the, uh, the difference in vegetation, the vegetation height, which we'll be creating later on. So for now, let's create a new map for the digital surface model. Let's go ahead and right click DEM, copy, right click on maps, paste. And by default, it just puts a one after the name of whatever the previous name of the map was. So we're going to change it from DEM1 to DSM. And then go ahead and open up DSM. And now let's close GWNF the map. And let's move DSM next to DEM so we could have them side by side. All right, so right now they look the same. Make sure DSM is selected. Go ahead and turn off the DEM layer. We don't need it. And we will now create our uh, digital surface model. So go back to the geoprocessing pane. Uh, you can actually leave it on LAS dataset to raster because we are going to create another one, but this time we'll be creating a digital surface model. Um, oh, I skipped a step, I'm sorry. Let's back up, let's back up. Let's go back to uh, the, the LAS file. So making sure that the DSM map is selected. Go ahead and click on GWNF LAS. Make sure your LAS file is selected. Appearance, and we're gonna change the uh, filter from ground to first returns. Why do we do this? First returns are going to give us the visible surface. The surface includes not just the bare earth as in elevation, but also all of the objects or material on the bare earth. So that could be trees. In this case, it will be trees. If it were in an urban environment, it would be buildings. All right, It'd be cars if they're parked and if the, you know, if the spatial resolution is good enough. But in this case, it's, it's a rural um, wilderness environment. So um, the first returns are just going to be basically trees on the landscape. Let's go ahead and choose that. And just so we can see, let's zoom in and get our point cloud to show up. So uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to tell the difference from the ground versus surface when uh, we're talking about the point cloud at this point. But once we convert it to a raster, you will definitely notice a difference. So. Um, make sure that GWNF LAS is the input data set. For the output, we are going to create it a DSM, obviously, so change the name from DEM to DSM. All of the other inputs will be the same from before, so binning, uh, inter interpolation type binning, uh, value field elevation, cell site maximum, uh, void fill method, natural neighbor, output data type, floating point, and so on and so forth. Go ahead and give it a run. All right, so you've pro you can probably notice a pretty significant difference between, uh, even in black and white, between the surface model and the elevation model. You can make out actual what are probably trees. You can make out what is a linear feature through here. Suppose it could be a river, but um, it's more likely a road. And you can tell that because the elevation seems to go down a bit lower here to the right. So that's, that's a road along the hillside. So you get to see other objects besides just the bare earth. You get to actually make out things on the landscape here. Okay. All right, but we're not going to leave it as a black and white image. We are going to symbolize it. Let's go ahead and right click on DSM symbology. And then let's choose another symbology scheme that looks appropriate for this. Let's go with elevation one again. And now that I think that really gives some definition to the, uh, the surface model. All right. Okay. Next up, we are basically going to do some raster mathematics. We are going to calculate the vegetation height. And what that essentially is, is the difference between the surface model and the elevation model. So the difference between what is on the surface and the bare earth beneath it. But before we do that, we are going to create a new map, just as we did for the DEM and the DSM. It's so gonna go back to the catalog pane, right click DSM, copy, right click maps and paste. And we will change the name to height.
and then go ahead and open up height. And in this case, you can actually close DEM and DSM for now. Height will have all of the data that we've already created. All right, so you can go ahead and leave it, leave the layers on as they currently are, but just only have the height map open. And then go back to the geoprocessing pane, hit the back button, and then type in minus and hit enter. So there are actually three different toolboxes that contain a tool called minus. 3D analyst, image analyst, and spatial analyst. Each of these is appropriate in certain situations. All right, so in our case, we are dealing with raster data. Raster data is the purview of the spatial analyst tool set. So we're gonna go ahead and do minus within the spatial analyst toolbox. The input for raster one will be DSM because that will be the uh, layer from which we'll be subtracting the surface. So DSM, value two, DEM, output raster will be called height. Height is the difference between the two. Height. All right, go ahead and run it now. All right, so my two-year-old was just in here. I had to pause the recording. Uh, and so in that time, the process is run, and now I have the height raster layer. All right, so right there on the left-hand side. So that has been created. And then I just want to read this brief little section here. Uh, a raster data set that has a floating point or decimal value does not have an attribute table, something to be aware of. So if you think back to when we run these uh, calculations, the raster, the LAS file to raster, we chose floating point as one of the parameters. So if these are non-whole numbers, non-integers, uh, they will not have an attribute table. So what we need to do in order to classify our data, we need to have whole numbers. So we run what's called the integer tool. We actually did this early on in the semester. We're going to do that now. Do that again now. It's uh, in the geoprocessing pane. Do a search for int, int. And again, you've got three different int integer tools, depending on the context. In ours, the spatial analyst. So go int, spatial analyst tools. Input raster will be height. Output raster, we will call it int height, I mean, just like the book, int underscore h i h e i g h t. Okay, int height, and then run it. So all it does is it truncates off the decimal place. Okay, so it makes them into integers and whole numbers. That way, we can then open up the attribute table and view the uh, the data. And what the data is essentially going to contain is really just one attribute, and that's, well, actually it contains two. Typically, raster data contains one, but it's going to have the elevation, which is the actual data, and then a count, the number of times an elevation value occurs. So let's say that we're talking about elevation 500 feet. Um, if, you know, 1,200 locations are at 500 feet in a raster, then it'll have a 1,200 for count and 500 for the value. So go ahead and open up the attribute table for int height. And we've got a value field and we have a count field. So first thing we see is a negative two. Well, that's not possible because we're talking about from the surface on up. So we know that there are some errors in here. So negative two occurred two times, negative one occurred 22 times. Our next task now that we have essentially calculated the difference between the surface and the bare earth model, uh, is to classify or reclassify all the different values, all of the elevation values into um, one of four categories. The categories being uh, errors, shrubs, so the lowest types of vegetation shrubs, small regen, that would be areas of new regenerative growth, um, small regenerated areas, so shorter trees presumably, uh, large regen or areas of large regenerative, regenerative growth, and then finally, uh, trees or tall trees that have been there for some period. So older growth forest. So essentially we have errors, we have shrubs, we have small regenerative areas, large regenerative areas, and trees, old growth trees. All right. So in order to classify all of these various values into those five categories, we have to use the uh, reclassify tool. So in order to do that, we need to do a search. So let's go back to the geoprocessing pane. Hit the back button and do a search for reclassify. Reclassify spatial analyst once again. 
All right, so we are going to then uh, make sure that the input raster is set to int height, value, uh, reclass field is value, and then click on the classify right there. And this is a little bit different than the textbook. The textbook has you go through and reclassify each of the values individually, which is a huge waste of time and inefficient. So if you click classify and do the number of classes, set that to five, just like we talked about, errors, shrubs, small regen, large regen trees, go ahead and hit OK. Then it's going to allow you to basically capture all the values that fall within your chosen ranges. So to get rid of the errors, those uh, values that were below zero, we're going to do start negative two to zero. OK, and then we are going to reclassify them as just zero. So anything that's below zero will be reclassed to zero. Next class will be everything from oops, um, one foot to five feet. New class will be one. Everything from six feet to 15 feet will be two. Everything from 16 feet to 25 feet will be three. Everything from 26 feet and up. So you leave, put in 26 and leave the next value as the default, whatever it was, 1271, and change it to four. Then leave the no data as, as, as is. For the output, we will change the name to um, reclass. So you can just get rid of int one to reclass. And then go ahead and give it a run. Okay, so we have our newly reclassified data set, and we have classified each of the value ranges into either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So let's close the attribute table here. I might have done that earlier. Uh, and now we're going to change the colors, and we're going to label these. So let's go ahead and go to the um, Symbology pane. Right-click the new output, Symbology. For class 0, Let's, oops, sorry, ignore that. Uh, for class zero, make it white. And we will make the label errors. For class one, let's make it like a light yellow, yucca yellow. And the label will be a shrub. For class two, let's make it a light green, like Svazerite green. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I never have figured that one out. Uh, and we'll call this uh, small regen. For value three, let's make it a slightly darker green. How about uh, macaw green? and call it large regen. And finally, for category four, let's make it fur green and call it trees. Or you could, you know, just call it trees. Trees. All right. So we've now reclassified it. And now it's starting to look like something. You can start to uh, maybe think, hmm, what's going on here? Why? Do we have the vast majority of it being an old growth forest with these patches of small and large regeneration and some low 
shrubs? Well, I will let you uh, think about that because that will be one of the answers you will have to provide on the assignment. I will not give you the answer to that one, but I think you could probably figure out the answer. All right. Next thing we are going to do is create a map layout. And the map layout will contain all of the um, map uh, inserts or uh, map frames that we just created, we've just worked on. So let's go ahead and do that. So you're going to insert new layout uh, letter, portrait letter. And then we will need to insert our actual map frame. So first map frame we will select is um, GWNF, the original George Washington National Forest. Let's go ahead and draw that on there. And I would obviously encourage you to um, include some guides to make it symmetrical. I'm, uh, I'm going to do that real quick. If you just right click on add guide, and I like to do one at about a quarter inch from the edge, which actually, let me let me actually show you how to do, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'll show you real quickly how to, uh, how to add guides that are all a certain distance from the edge. Do add guides, orientation, both, placement, offset from edge, and we'll just do one quarter. That's one quarter inch from the edge. So now we end up with four guides that are all a quarter inch from the edge. So let's go ahead and snap that one to ours. My mouse is being a little wonky. Um, and then we will actually put another guide right in the middle. So if this is eight and a half inches in width. Let's put one right at four and a quarter. Snap that here, put it right around right about the middle, and then right click on GWNF Forest, zoom to layer. All right, next map frame, we will do the, uh, the height. So choose height, draw your map, and snap it there. And actually, now that I'm thinking about this, I'm just remembering, actually, we want to leave space for a legend. So let's actually pull that back to three and a half, three and a half inches, the guide, and then snap to the guide there at three and a half inches. Oops, not that one, this one. We want to leave room for the legend. And then we will put this, I should have left this guide here. Add it four and a quarter snap to it and then oh geez, maps are not cooperating make sure you leave room for this legend as well next up we are going to insert our um, dem put that one right about here leave room at the bottom for a title and in this case we will want to uh, we want to um, zoom to the dem layer Oh, that's not working. Uh, instead, zoom to GWNF LAS. There we go. Okay, I'm not sure why it's like that. Okay, and then lastly, DEM. Oh, sorry, D DSM rather. DSM, we just did DEM. Uh, we're going to go ahead and keep it the same as the other. Leaving room for a legend. There we go. All right. So I will not I will not sit here and record all the various steps. We've done this in class multiple times. You're going to need four scale bars, one north arrow because they all have the same north arrow orientation and a title. Now for the title, I recommend using the same title that I came up with in my map which looks like the following. Vegetation height in George Washington National Forest. Notice how we have a north arrow, four scale bars, and three legends. Let's inc include a legend for each one. Uh, we don't need one for the, the area map there, but we do need three legends. One for the vegetation height, one for the DEM, one for the DSM. All right. 
Uh, when you're done, go ahead and export it to PDF, uh, upload it to Canvas for tonight's assignment, and be sure to answer the questions posted there as well. You will have one week to submit the assignment. Uh, it will be due a week from tonight, which is March 25th um, at the start of class, 6.30. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop me an email, or I'm also going to set up the message board there on Canvas so we can have kind of a community discussion there as needed. Um, I posted an announcement today that has a little bit more information. We will, I will provide more info as the, the days tick by. It's been a crazy time for me, as I'm sure it has been for you, so I'm trying to, you know, get my bearings. But um, we can get everyone on the same page hopefully quickly, and we will finish up the semester as an online course. Uh, I know you didn't sign up for that, but uh, that's a circumstance, so uh, we'll make the best of it. All right, um, have a great night, everyone. I will hopefully talk to you soon. Bye-bye.